Productive and Unproductive Labor by James O'Connor. Marx regarded the theory of productive and unproductive labor as the foundation of the theory of capital accumulation and capitalist development. The theory of capital disaccumulation and primitive socialism also must be based on the theory of productive and unproductive labor. Moreover, the orthodox Marxist interpretation of productive and unproductive labor is flawed in various ways, in particular regarding the analysis of capitalist production itself. Our thesis is that production, labor, and capitalist society is simultaneously productive and unproductive, and the analysis of the contradictory and dialectical character of labor in production is essential to a scientific understanding of the decline of capitalism and rise of primitive socialism. 1. Modes of production and class struggle. Marx insisted that the specific meaning of production and unproductive or of productive and unproductive labor emerges from the particular mode of production under investigation. Productive labor in one mode of production is unproductive labor in another mode of production. This historical specificity of the two kinds of labor is so important that a few introductory remarks on the general meaning of mode of production are necessary. The most basic meaning of mode of production is way of life or the more restricted way of working. In any society, people work with tools, means of production, on natural or made materials, object, objects of production, and create products, results of production. These tools, objects, and results of production are forces of production. Human capacities to use tools, design machines, fabricate products, etc., are also pro uh, forces of production. Since people work together in an organized way, human capacities to produce depend on the particular way the producers organize their work or have their work organized for them. The organization of work or the particular relations which the producers have with one another in the production process is also a productive force. Two general ways of working or organizing work life are possible. One is the individual or collective self-organization of producers who use their own means and objects of production and distribute their own products. The second is class society in which one class owns or controls the means and objects of production and organizes the labor of the producing class with the purposes of producing and appropriating a surplus product which becomes the material basis of life for the owning class. In a society in which production is self-organized, the only relations of production are those social relationships which the producers have established themselves. Although Marx rightly states that the forces and relations of production are two different sides of the development of the social individual, self-organized production means that the relations of production are merely one constituent part of the productive forces. No contradiction between productive forces and production relations exists because there is only one class, the producing class. In class society, where production is organized by the owning class with the purpose of exploiting the producing class, there arises a structural tension in the relationships which the producers have with the owning class and with one another. But another way, or put another way, the general meaning of class struggle is that social classes are defined in terms of the antagonistic relationship they have with one another. In class society, where one class organizes the labor of another class, there always exists class struggle in one form or another, and with one end or another. The problem is not to prove that classes exist or stand in a certain antagonistic relationship, but rather to identify the actions, reactions, reconstructions, and reconstitutions, i.e. the concrete element in everyday life, which occur at the individual or small group level, but which in effect are universal. 
If two people who are in the same objective position in relation to the means of production and the owning class and its authority apparatus develop the capacity to respond routinely or creatively to the same objective alienation, exploitation, and oppression, they act as members of their class, whether or not they communicate their acts to each other directly or beforehand. If in a slave society, an individual slave runs away, the reason is that he or she is a slave. The fact that it is an individual act does not mean that it is not an element of class struggle. Quite the contrary, the social meaning of individual acts can only be understood in class terms. It may be that precisely because the individual who runs away is a slave, the only response possible is an individual response. This does not mean that at the level of individual understanding and action, people in rebellion or passive resistance understand themselves as members of a class. But when an individual feels oppressed or is hungry or in pain and sees a chance to strike back or escape or struggle for freedom, a definite class psychology is involved. Although this class psychology is rooted in the objective class situation, seen as a historical process, it expresses itself in different ways in different people in accordance with all the social um, pro all the social process which intersect in a person's life. The fact that a house slave deals with the master in one way and that a field hand deals with the master in another and quite different way does not mean that they are not both slaves. Nor is it true that because they both deal with their slavery in some way that they have a class consciousness of themselves as slaves. The basic fact is that they are both slaves independent of their specific situation and hence are compelled to deal with those who own them and organize their labor. Their individual struggles are thus slave struggles as well as individual struggles of people in a more or less individual situation. If mode of production consists of both the productive forces and production relations, then mode of production means way of life. This means that the way of life in class societies is antagonistic or based on force and counterforce. This becomes clear when the means of production in the hands of the owning class are understood to be so many means of discipline and control of the producing class. In the European modes of production, i.e. slavery, feudalism, and capitalism, slave owner, lord, and capitalist were not concerned primarily with the production of wealth, but rather the production of surplus wealth. Surplus wealth requires surplus labor or exploitation. On the other side, slave, serf, and wage laborer face the problem of the reduction or elimination of surplus wealth or its mode of appropriation and distribution. Freedom for the owning class is the freedom to exploit the labor of the producing class. Freedom for the producers is the freedom from surplus labor, i.e. freedom from the owning class. More specifically, the production relations in class society are antagonistic because of the coexistence of two warring principles of labor or work organization, i.e. the coexistence of the owning and producing classes. Further, we will argue that the struggle between the exploiting and producing classes over the organization of work, distribution of the product of work, conditions of work, object and results of work, etc., is the living contradiction between the productive forces and production relations. Finally, we must ask, what does this structural tension between the exploiting and exploited classes signify for social theory? Briefly, we think that if the way of life in class society is antagonistic, then the theory of class society also must be antagonistic. If there is a theory of the origins and development of a particular class society, there must also be a theory of the decay and demise of that society. If there is room in the theory for the labor of the producing class, then there must be, or fuck, 
If there is room in the theory for the conditions under which the ruling class is able to alienate and exploit the labor of the producing class, then there must be room for the conditions under which the ruling class is unable to alienate and exploit labor. If the theory includes the conditions and kind of labor discipline and control, it must also include the conditions and kind of labor, labor in discipline and absence of control. If it contains an explanation of how the owning class restrains the producing class, it must also show how the producing class restrains the ruling class. If it is in an economic theory which emphasizes the process by which wealth in a particular form is produced, it must give equal emphasis to the process by which wealth in the same form is destroyed. In general terms, if the theory is an explanation of why society works when it does work, it must be a theory of why society doesn't work when it doesn't, in the literal as well as figurative sense. For capitalist society, if we have a theory of productive labor, accumulation, and capitalist development, we also need a theory of unproductive labor, capital disaccumulation, and socialist development. Two, productive and reproductive labor in circulation. Marxism traditionally defines exchange labor in commodity society as unproductive labor, but the fact that things and services are commodities means that they are produced or rendered in a form in which they can be distributed through exchange. Hence, a perfect distinction between the labor of production and the labor of exchange cannot be made. But there is a working definition of what Marx calls the productive labor of production and transportation and storage and the unproductive labor of exchange. When commodity owners meet in the market, they engage in two simultaneous activities. Property rights to money are transferred from money owners to product owners and property rights to products are transferred from product owners to money owners. At the same time, products are distributed from one person to another. The exchange of products for money is the way that products are distributed in commodity society. In the grocery store, the owner or clerk measures the required amount of flour, breaks open a curtain of cigarettes, etc., and puts your groceries in a bag. The grocer's labor does not produce new use values, but it does move use values where they are needed and alters the form of use values in desired ways. This kind of activity is not unique to commodity society. In any society, things are measured, stored, packaged, etc. Marx calls this activity the actual locomotion of commodities in space, which he states resolves itself into the transport of commodities. He clearly states that this activity is productive labor. At a certain moment in the grocery store, you hand the grocer money and he hands you flour, cigarettes, etc. You wait while he rings up the money and gives you change. A moment earlier, when the grocer measured the flour, his labor saved you the time and trouble of doing it. But when you hand him your money and wait for the change it costs you, it costs you time and trouble as well as the grocer. Although in the absence of exchange and exchange labor, planning and planning labor are required. This activity of transferring property rights is called by Marx pure circulation and is unproductive in the strict sense that no use values are produced nor useful services rendered. Although exchange labor is required to realize values and hence is reproductive labor, of commodity or capitalist society as a whole, it does not add to wealth or surplus wealth in capitalist society, but merely results in the exchange of wealth which has been already produced. Marx states flatly that the general law of commodities do not add to their value, but are merely expenses incurred in the realization of the value or in its conversion from one form to another. Examples of pure circulation or exchange labor are counting money, buying and selling money, bonds and stocks, which are claims on money, negotiating stock options, which are claims on claims on money, 
etc. Although Marx clearly states that the costs of distribution labor arise from pro processes of production, which are only continued in circulation, the productive character of which is hence merely concealed in the circulation form, some Marxists have a bad habit of equating distribution with exchange and hence confuse productive labor with productive workers and unproductive labor with unproductive workers. For example, after quoting Marx to the effect that storing, transporting, and other heterogeneous functions are connected with commercial capital, and that only the pure functions of capital in the sphere of circulation, the acts of buying and selling do not produce value. One writer actually remarks that the important conclusion is that commercial workers are unproductive laborers. Only when there is a completely separate class or stratum of workers which does nothing except buy and sell is it possible to conclude here are unproductive workers. In reality, merchants and clerks not only buy and sell, but also move goods, package goods, etc. Pure circulation or exchange labor is a species of guard labor. Consider the labor of the ticket seller at a movie house. The seller's task is merely to transfer the right to sit in the theater to the moving moviegoer in exchange for the price of a ticket. But, but it may not be immediately obvious that it is not the lack of a ticket that keeps you out of the theater. If Woodstock proved nothing else, it proved this. The ticket is actually torn up and discarded by a husky young man who stands between the box office and the seat that you want. Marx writes that it is plain that commodities cannot go to market and make exchanges of their own account. We must, therefore, have recourse to their guardians, who are also their owners. Both ticket seller and ticket taker are guardians of the theater owner's property. They are charged with the keeping out anyone without a ticket, and hence are nothing more nor less than guards. Workers behind cash registers, bank tellers, store guards, watchmen, etc., are in whole or part engaged as special police enforcing the property rights of commodity owners. Money counting is also a kind of guard labor. Bookkeeping and accounting and related activities are required to guard products and services as commodities, i.e. to ensure that objects and services function as commodities in the sense of making sure that only those who pay the full price of the commodity actually get it, figuring out whether prices are sufficiently high to cover costs, etc. In commodity and capitalist society, there is another level of guard labor organized by the state. The labor of the state police can be interpreted in whole or part as the labor of pure circulation in general. A cop doesn't guard the seats in a particular cinema, but rather keeps an eye on each and every property in transfer of property rights. The police have a double function because they must guard not only property and property transfers, but also the private guards. They are simultaneously the strong arms and guardians of the guards, which explains why most cops in most places have a kind of benevolent patriarchal relationship with storekeepers and tradesmen, cashiers, etc. Also, at the level of circulation as a whole, the labor of judges, jailers, and the remainder of the repressive apparatus of the state is indispensable for the police to perform their sacred duty. In more complex but no less important ways, regulatory commissions, which guard the commodity form by regulating product prices, Social welfare bureaucracies, which guard the commodity form by keeping an eye on welfare clients. Schools, which guard the commodity form by socializing children to respect private property. And so, and so on, all perform guard functions for society as a whole. Guard labor in both the sphere of circulation and the state is hired for its use value rather than its exchange value because it produces no exchange value. Productive labor produces commodities and hence the productivity of productive labor in principle is measurable. 
If it is more profitable to produce one thing rather than another, or one thing in a new way, the capitalists will happily reorganize production. In production, the development of skills and abilities is contingent on exchange value and surplus value production. This is because the content of the commodity or its concrete use value form is always changing in a capitalist economy. By contrast, the purpose of guard labor is not to produce something, but to avoid something, i.e. to minimize losses and failures and other threats to the commodity form itself. As Off says, this means that in the case of productive labor, productivity can be measured, but not in the case of guard labor. No accountant or sales clerk or policeman can make an objective claim as to how many losses he or she has helped to prevent. The capitalists' obsession with preventing anybody from interfering with things and services from becoming commodities is a constant in capitalist society. The preservation of the commodity form of objects and services is the only constant in a world otherwise subject to constant change, in much the same way the family or tribal council and planning board are the basic constants in primitive and modern socialist societies. Guard labor reproduces the formal structures of capitalism and maintains and reproduces capitalist production relations. Guard labor does not produce commodities or in capitalism surplus wealth, yet without guard labor, commodity production and surplus wealth production would be impossible. The same conclusions may be drawn about the other important kinds of circulation labor, which we can call realization labor. This is the activity of advertising, publicizing, marketing, etc., which is required for the reproduction of the system as a whole, but which is not productive of values. The function of realization labor is not to guard property, count money, etc., but to communicate symbols about the commodity to make it appear that it is a definite use value. Since needs in commodity society are not decided upon prior to the production of commodities, the idea that a product is needed must be conveyed and accepted before that product can become a commodity. Realization labor thus results in someone wanting something or some service or believing he or she needs it. This labor is necessary because the capitalist must organize not only the production of a thing or service, but also the production of an idea about the thing or service. E.g., if you want status or to feel good, use our product. Like other specific forms of circulation labor, realization labor is employed within the aim of minimizing unproductive labor in exchange. Thus, as off remarks, advertising labor attempts to minimize the number of people for whom the commodity is produced who do not buy it. Yet we must emphasize that in capitalism, realization labor power, like all unproductive exchange labor power, is paid its own costs of reproduction and its employer makes a profit like on any other employer. Thus, although this kind of labor does not produce value or surplus value, it is exploited in the limited sense that it does not share in society's total surplus value, i.e. it is surplus labor, although it does not produce surplus value. Three. Productive and reproductive labor in production. Reproductive labor is human activity which creates and maintains and reproduces a particular mode of production. The labor of pure exchange, as well as subsistence labor in the home and much labor of supervision in production, as we will see, are reproductive labor, assuming they actually fulfill their function of guarding the commodity form, reproducing labor power exploitable as capital, and controlling labor in the production process. Ticket takers who let their friends into the movie free of charge, home cooks who make the laborer sick, and supervisors who look the other way when the worker sabotages a machine are obviously non-productive laborers or non-reproductive laborers. 
everything else being the same. Hundreds of specific forms of reproductive labor and potentially non-reproductive labor can be located in production, reproduction, and circulation activities organized in whole or in part by the state. Systematic examination of these kinds of reproductive labor would take us well beyond the scope of this study and would require detailed examination of the labor process organized in circulation and reproduction by the family and state, including division of labor, specialization of function, systems of hierarchical control, role of sexism within the family, etc. Moreover, precisely because family and state organized reproductive and circulation activity is typically oriented not by exchange value, but by use value criteria, such an examination would have to include the political and ideological legitimations put forward by those who initiate and play in the particular activity as well as those who engage in the activity. Since the study of the labor process in reproduction is in its infancy, particularly in so far as the state organizes the reproduction of labor power, and since there are, to our knowledge, no thorough and systematic empirical studies of the relationship between the labor process as material activity and the ideological process of its rationalization within the state, we can do no more, no more than mention these fundamentally important problems and pass on to the theory of productive and unproductive labor in capitalist production proper. The general meaning of productive labor in class society is human activity, which results in a surplus of use values or useful services. Defined this way, productive labor is the basic form of reproductive labor. Surplus means goods and services created by the producing class and appropriated by the owning class, i.e. goods and services over and above those needed for the reproduction of the labor power of the producing class. As important as the surplus itself is the manner in which it is produced. Because productive labor in class society is surplus labor, it is always organized by someone other than the producers themselves. And it is always organized in a particular way that must be congruent with the general character of the class relations in the society. In the slave mode of production of ancient Greece, the ruling class looked down upon manual work and Aristotle actually wrote that the worst kind of constitution put political power in the hands of the producing class. Slavery was thus legitimated by the argument that what the slaves did, did was, beneath, was beneath contempt and that the only good life was the life of contemplation, or at worst, the life of organizing the labor of others. The ruling class of the tribe of Israel was a priest class which believed that work was a penalty for sin, and although it was considered to be odious, it was also seen as necessary with a certain worth and meaning. Yet, it was written that the labor of man does not satisfy the soul, which is not a bad ideology for a ruling class priest. As Steve Heimer tells us, that personification of English imperialism and colonialism, Robinson Crusoe taught Friday how to produce more surplus wealth, not only more wealth. Robinson wanted Friday to learn to produce for Robinson, not merely to produce. Friday thus learned to bow and scrape as well as to build and cultivate, and the former as much as the latter were reproductive activities and the two-man subsistence economy of Defoe's imagination. In feudal society, the ruling class appropriated surplus labor in the form of labor dues and surplus crops. But surplus labor not only took certain forms, but also was exercised in a certain way, i.e. in deference to lord and church. St. Augustine actually said he believed that it was better to give up land and labor and live in a monastery than to till the soil or manufacture handicrafts. The formation of ideology and consciousness are thus crucial elements in the formation of productive labor and surplus and are absolutely indispensable to the total societal reproductive process. Mm. 
before productive labor can turn into its opposite, unproductive labor, slave, serf, etc., consciousness must turn into its opposite, i.e. the consciousness of a free person historically defined. Productive labor creates not only surplus wealth, which reproduces particular social relationships of dominance and dependence in a material sense, but also these very same social relationships in a social and ideological sense. A bonded serf who throws sur surplus grain in the face of the lord of the manor at that moment ceases to be a serf. Workers in the modern period who insist on selling their labor power and refuse to leave the factory when the boss wants to close it because it is unprofitable at that moment are no longer wage workers. Productive labor thus has a double meaning because it results in a particular kind of exploita exploitative social relationship as well as producing the material basis for the existence and expansion of the exploiting class. If we abstract wage labor from the particular stage of capitalist development and decline, we can see that it also results in its own ideological preconditions, i.e. its own reproductive or reproduction conditions. In fact, the possibility arises that the worker not only produces value and surplus value, but also voluntarily and eagerly initiates the expanded production of value, such as the nature of capitalist production. As Marx took so much pain to show, the fact that surplus values in capitalism are produced in the wage-labor relationship and realized in the market explains why it appears that no surplus values are produced at all. Beyond the despotism of the factory itself, no overt and visible coercion is necessary for the production and appropriation of surplus value in a functioning capitalist economy. It appears that no surplus is produced because workers exchange labor power at its value and buy products at their value. Nevertheless, productive labor creates value over and above the exchange value of the labor power of the workers employed. Surplus value is the difference between the exchange value of labor power and the exchange value of the product of labor. The wage-labor relationship results in additional ideological preconditions for its own existence and reproduction. The fact that the wage itself is the price of labor power means that the wage never rises high enough in relation to the cost of reproduction of labor power to permit the worker to escape the necessity of wage labor. Moreover, because wage labor is organized by the boss within the factory or office as a kind of forced collectivization, workers do not desire to make their own products because they do not decide the conditions and purpose of labor. The experience of wage labor thus teaches workers to buy values in the market rather than produce values themselves for their own need. This establishes a psychological as well as material basis for the expansion of consumption or the growth of value realization. The experience of wage labor also teaches workers that work itself is an activity which they do not want to need and hence an activity which they do not seek to manage. On the contrary, one which they seek to escape. This reinforces the domination of the boss in the workplace and establishes a psychological basis for the expansion of surplus value. In sum, wage labor takes away the workers' capacity to provide their own needs and replace this capacity with the surrogate money. In a capitalist economy, precisely because it is a class society, Marx explodes the concept of value into two parts. The part that workers get, variable capital or socially necessary labor, and the part that capitalists get, surplus value or surplus labor. This theoretical explosion of value is required because of the explosion of petty commodity production, self-earned property, into capitalism where labor power is the property of one class and means of production are the property of another class. Now it is necessary to consider why outlays on wages are called variable capital with the aim of clarifying why wage labor must produce surplus value. Labor power in capitalist economy is a commodity which is sold to the boss at more or less its value to be used up or consumed by him. 
But this transaction <clears throat> between boss and worker is highly ambiguous. Exactly what is bought and sold. When an individual buys an orange, he or she normally knows what is being pur purchased. When a homeowner buys the services of a house painter, he or she is buying a painted house, i.e. a use value, and does not expect the painter to fix the plumbing nor even to inform the homeowner how the house will be painted. But when the capitalist buys labor power, he doesn't know what capacities of the worker he is going to use up nor how much he will use of any particular capacity. More, the boss may not even know what he wants to use, nor how, how fast he wants to use it up. What he does know is that he doesn't want the worker's creative capacities generally, but only those capacities which can be exploited within the capitalist production relations, i.e. those which can be brought within the capitalist production or those which can be brought into play by bribery and coercion, and which are required for a certain period of time as measured mechanically by the clock. He also knows that he also knows that he needs to exploit these capacities for the entire workday. Labor power which is not used is valueless, and without proper motivation and supervision, the worker may very well do nothing for eight hours. It has been known to happen. What exactly the worker is expected to do and how, at what speed, and with whom is in principle never made clear during the original exchange of money for labor power. The reason is that the worker's labor produces value, but it does not realize value. Until the worker's product is sold in the market, its value is not realized. New production processes, processes which cheapen products placed on the market by competing capitalists, new products which replace old products, new transportation and communication systems which facilitate fresh competition from distant territories, new materials and synthetics which could substitute for existing materials, and so on may alone or together lower the exchange value of products and push prices down or up. Variations in immediate market conditions in production and distribution conditions in other sectors of the economy require variations in the concrete labor capacities consumed by the capitalist, as well as the amount of capacities consumed. By contrast, variations in the exploitation of guard labor and circulation are not governed by quantitative criteria determined by market forces, but rather by real or potential threats to the market, e.g. the incidence of robbery, robbery or fraud. The entire the entire capitalist economic system is a fluid structure of real and potential concrete labor tasks that the worker is forced into and out of depending on underlying and immediate market conditions. Is it any wonder that modern sociologists can predict neither the occupational fate of the individual nor the origin of the person who will next fill a given job. We add that they cannot predict the nature of the job itself either. At all times, the boss must be free to vary concrete tasks and how much of the worker's labor power that is actually used. He needs to be able to make the worker work harder or faster or to set the worker to work doing different things, i.e. change the division of labor by changing concrete labor tasks. This is understood as the boss's right as temporary owner of the commodity labor power. The ambiguity in the exchange of labor power for wages thus does not arise because of anyone's incompetence or because of imperfect market information, but rather is a necessary attribute of the purchase of labor power itself. The general conclusion is that labor cannot be variable in the traditional Marxist sense of resulting in surplus value more value than the value of labor power, unless the capitalist can vary the use of labor power in accordance with the quantitative criteria of the market. If work activity in capitalist economy was defined in terms of more or less fixed motions, rhythms, and rituals, the consumption of labor power would be more or less fixed, both concretely and abstractly. Concrete labor could not be changed, and hence abstract labor could not expand, 
excepting by adding to the total number of laborers. Capitalism, in effect, would be impossible. When the boss buys raw materials, machinery, tools, etc., he acquires constant capital. When he buys the labor power for a given period of time, he acquires variable capital, i.e. capital in the form which produces capital. A close theoretical look at wage labor demonstrates this. To begin with, <clears throat> consider independent commodity production and the definition of labor power. What is its use value? The general meaning of use value is the value of something to someone when it is used. Labor is simply the use of labor power and concrete labor is thus nothing more than the use value of labor power. In independent commodity production, the producers use their own labor power, but in capitalism, the boss buys labor power and the right to use it. But labor power in capitalism, unlike independent commodity production, is exchange value. The definition of wage labor, thus, is the value in use of a capacity which is a value in exchange. This means that labor power is used to produce use values only insofar as it can be used to produce exchange values and surplus value. Why would a boss want to use an exchange value unless he wished to use it to produce more exchange value than the labor power originally cost? He wouldn't. And no use value or exchange value will be produced unless the exchange value of labor power is less than the exchange value of the product created. This is the basic principle underlying the boss's decision to buy labor power in particular quantities and to consume labor power in particular ways. For this reason, Marx says that capitalist production can be described either as commodity production or as surplus value production. They mean the same thing as commodities are not produced unless surplus value is produced. Now we can grasp the formal meaning of productive labor. It is labor that produces capital, i.e. a social relationship of production within which working activity is organized. It is the basic form of labor required to reproduce the system as a whole. Productive labor must be sharply distinguished from the ideological concept of productivity employed by bourgeois economists. Productivity theoretically is a measure of output per worker hour but output in reality depends not only on the stage of devel development of the productive forces, i.g. kinds of machinery, etc., but also on the production relations. Productivity in part measures the boss's ability to exploit labor efficiently and hence is an indication of the production relations, as well as the productive forces. Bourgeois economists deny that capitalists exploit workers, i.e. that the production relations of capitalism are any different from those characterizing petty commodity production. Hence for them, productivity measures the development of the productive forces alone. They are thus unable to understand that it is precisely within the capitalist social relations of production that concrete and abstract labor are regulated. The, the level of employment and unemployment, the pace and hours of work, the division of labor within the capitalist enterprise, the degree of utilization of machinery, etc., are all governed by quantitative criteria in the absence of any challenge on the part of workers to the capitalist domination of production. Capitalist production relations, strictly speaking, are not even possible unless the boss can evaluate the worker's labor in terms of exchange value criteria. Capital is also a social relationship in the sense that productive labor produces the capitalist or results in the reproduction of the capitalist class structure. Capitalist production, Marx writes, reproduces the separation between labor power and means of labor. It thereby reproduces and perpetuates the condition for exploiting the laborer. At this level of analysis, productive labor has to do with material things only secondarily and is primarily a sociological category. But a capitalist without means and objects of production is not a real capitalist, only an abstraction, and ownership of real means of production is the condition for exploiting labor. 
Although capital is not merely a thing, a monopoly of ownership of things confers social power because it permits the capitalist to organize society's labor. Means of production are the means whereby owners exploit the labor of non-owners. Universalizing capital as a social relation requires the conversion of surplus value into more means of production, economic wealth of the capitalist class, and labor power, social power of the capitalist class. The expansion of the means of production and the growth of capitalist production relations are thus merely two sides of the same historical process. Turned around the, contra the contraction of the means of production as means of surplus production and the decline of capitalist relations of production are the two sides of the historical process of capitalist decay. To conclude, productive labor reproduces and expands the means of production and also the control of the boss over the labor process and the workers who engage in this process. These means of production are not only instruments required to produce things, but also things that are required to use workers as instruments. This formulation raises a problem when we consider service labor, i.e. working activity in which instruments of production play a minor role. In what sense can service labor be considered to be productive labor in capitalism? Marx states that any labor that produces capital is productive labor. The opera singer employed by a capitalist to sing in public for the capitalist's profit labors productively. Although Marx does not tell us the exact process whereby service labor becomes capital, we can grasp this process by using the same general method he uses in the discussion of capital or of labor, which produces material objects. The means of production become capital, Marx writes only insofar as they have become separated from the laborer and confront the laborer as an independent power. In material production, workers produce machinery which is appropriated by the capitalist and subsequently is used to exploit the workers who produce it and also those who use it. Material labor thus indirectly reproduces the production relations between workers and bosses. By contrast, service labor directly reproduces capitalist production relations. In the case of the opera singer, we exclude the opera house itself, which is a means of production like any other and poses no special difficulty. In service labor, there are no objects which mediate between workers and capitalists, hence the need for a substitute. This substitute is the role in which the service worker labors. For example, the social worker's capacity to convince the welfare client that the system is fair or legitimate depends not only on the social worker's capacity for deception and self-deception, but also and mainly on the relationship established between worker and client, i.e. the fact that in this case, the first is an employee of the state and the second is a client of the state. Neither person can exist independently of the social relationship which they directly enter into. Put another way, if service labor is objectified in the form of another person's subjective life, i.e. if what is produced is precisely a particular social relationship, it becomes impossible to separate the objective and subjective sides of the labor process. A car worker may retire or emigrate without affecting the existence of the car, or the car may be junked without changing the life of the car worker. But once two individuals lock themselves into well-defined roles, e.g. doctor-patient, doctor-nurse, airline stewardess, passenger, social worker, client, or for that matter, manic depressive, husband, wife, etc. Then there's no escape for one without a basic change in the life and labor of the other. The role the service worker plays always expresses a certain ideology, which is inseparable from exchange or guard labor, and which takes the form of the boss or supervisor directing the worker in his or her role. Independent of the particular concrete service rendered, e.g. tending the bar, filling out forms behind the counter of an auto rental company, etc., this role normally abstracts from the concrete individuality of the worker. The boss typically orders both bartender and car rental clerk to pretend to take a personal interest in the customer, i.e. to make believe. Even the collection agent tries to make your past due bill into a personal matter. 
This results in the super contradiction of service workers having to suppress their true individuality, and in the last analysis having it abolished, while at the same time having to feign it, and in the last al analysis not having any individuality to feign. In this way, the role or part in the drama is the form that abstracts service labor assumes. Keeping these considerations in mind, it is obvious why it is difficult to put services on the basis of large-scale production. Marx himself believed that non-material production was so insignificant compared with the totality of production that it can be left entirely out of account. In our day, non-material production cannot be brushed aside so easily. But if we look to see how service labor is organized, we find that it either remains the province of small-scale production, e.g. personalized capital such as barber shops, or to the degree that it has grown and taken different forms, service labor is today organized mainly by the state, i.e. on non-capitalist principles. So far as capitalistically organized service labor is concerned, non-material working activity within the workplace poses no special problems. Marx calls non-material labor within the capital unit productive because it results finally in a material product, which is the common product of mental and manual labor. But what about the common situation mentioned above in which the worker is hired to serve the boss's customers? Examples include barbers, taxi drivers, gas station attendants, and people who put soft drinks into and take money out of vending machines. Other examples are rock bands and baseball players, whose labor is inextricably mixed with the labor of their audience. It has long been recognized that final customers perform part of the marketing function, but they also help perform the function of spectacle labor. More cheers from the fans encourage better encores and more bass hits. Spe spectacle labor confuses the distinction between production and consumption, reproduction, to the point that consumers produce and producers consume. In the extreme cases in which a ball player attacks a spectator or a member of an audience, audience mounts the stage and is incorporated spontaneously into the act, the definition of capital becomes problematic to say the least. Customer services in distribution and exchange have a similar character. Vending machines place the burden of work on the consumer, as do shopping centers and self-service supermarkets. In comparison with the days when tradespeople came to your neighborhood or door, sometimes salaried doctors do the same thing when they economize their hired nurses' time by having their patients take their own temperatures. In these examples, the capitalist replaces wage labor with the unpaid labor of the consumer. To a greater or smaller degree, workers produce surplus value for the capitalist, but the workers are their own means of production. The labor of producing commodities becomes inextricably mixed with the subsistence labor of reproducing labor power, not to speak of the labor of exchange. Precisely because the skills of service workers are themselves the main instruments of production, capital cannot develop in a form that confronts the laborer as an independent power, but rather is materialized subjectively in the capacities of both the producers and users themselves. The fact that there is always this element of use value in service labor, i.e. the fact that the capitalist in part hires the service worker for the use value of his or her labor, may be the reason why personal services in the last analysis are inconsistent with the capitalist organization of production, and hence are mechanized or replaced by mechanical substitutes. E.g. stereos and records, canned laughter, etc., which homogenize needs, advance large-scale production, and finally eliminate the importance of the personal attributes of the service worker. A good recording engineer can make almost any singer sound good, hence the only remaining problem is to totally mechanize or automate the production of sound, and in this way free capital from its present dependence on good sound engineers. The dial phone, automatic elevators, you drive it cars, record players, 
and so on are examples of means of production of useful services developed by capitalists to free, from, free them from their dependence on particular worker attributes on the one hand and transfer paid labor of employees to the unpaid labor of the consumer on the other. When we choose groceries at the supermarket, we are working for the boss in the sense that we are replacing clerk labor, which used to get the groceries off the shelves for us, and also we are working for ourselves. The mechanization of reorganization of services thus has a double meaning. This may underlie the fact that the more the service worker struggles against the boss in circulation or production, the more labor the consumer has to do. Four, unproductive and unreproductive labor in production. Marxism traditionally defines pure supervisory labor in capitalist production as unproductive labor. Pure supervision is a species of guard labor as the boss has to protect what, the, he, what he considers to be his property, i.e. the labor power of the direct producers. Some surplus value must be converted into supervisory labor or alienation with the aim of guaranteeing future surplus value production. Supervisory labor is organized to control and coordinate the labor process in the technical sense and the workers who engage in the process in the social sense. The labor of supervision and management, Marx writes, arising as it does out of an antithesis out of the supremacy of capital over labor and being therefore common to all modes of production based on class contradictions like the capitalist mode is directly and inseparably connected also under the capitalist system with productive functions which all combined social labor assigns to individuals as their special tasks Supervisory labor is reproductive labor because, as in the case of reproductive labor in circulation, it is necessary to the reproduction of the system as a whole. Like the greater part of the trading expenses, Marx tells us, supervisory labor belongs to the incidental expenses of capitalist production. Some modern Marxists broaden the concept of supervisory labor to include the labor of ideological control. In this connection, Lichtman refers to the highly complex and subtle bureaucratic structures whose main function is the control of the organized labor of masses of men and women whose understanding of the world must be similarly organized. More significant is the unproductive labor of the direct producers, which traditional Marxism ignores. Inefficiencies in production rooted in the primitive organization of industry or the failure of management to take advantage of existing opportunities to exploit labor power at the normal rate are called unproductive consumption of labor power by Marx. Defined thusly, unproductive consumption of labor power is a characteristic feature of early capitalism. But our concern is with unproductive labor as activity resisting or opposing capitalist production and distribution norms which originates with the working class itself. Since capitalist inefficiencies defined below may originate in either mismanagement or worker power, unproductive consumption of labor power must be clearly distinguished from unproductive labor. Unproductive labor in capitalist production is possible because of the special nature of the commodity labor power. Labor power is the only commodity which belongs to the worker and the capitalist at the same time, a logical impossibility yet the very basis of capitalist production. Although the worker sells labor power to the capitalist and hence the capitalist is the real owner, juridically speaking, labor power necessarily remains an attribute of the individual worker. Working capacity cannot be physically separated from the worker himself or herself, but only the worker's product. The reason is that in capitalist society, workers are juridically free outside of production and formally have civil rights. Unlike other modes of production in which religion and other forms of superstition function ideologically to control the producing class, capitalism's only religion is money. 
In pure capitalism, ideological control is exercised by the apparent equal exchange of equivalents on the market. Hence the rule of possessive individualism, i.e. the fact that the working class remains in physical possession of its work power. For this reason, it cannot be assumed that in any and all circumstances, labor power is exploited as capital or that the workers have no power for themselves. Our thesis is that only under special historical circumstance is labor power in fact capital. Briefly stated, these circumstances are threefold. First, the degradation of labor to abstract labor and the easy substitutability of one worker for another. Second, the existence of unemployed labor power, which competes in the market with employed labor power and permits the actual substitution of one worker by another when necessary. Third, a total reproduction process, which socializes workers into a fatalistic acceptance of wage labor. The first two circumstances require no comment, but a few words about the last are necessary. In capitalist production, workers are conflicted internally. There are two levels of self-control which must be exercised for day-to-day -day survival. One is keeping control of one's own capacities. The other is obeying the boss, which frequently requires much self-control. The psychic dimensions of this contradiction have never been analyzed systematically. What may be involved is revealed in a story by a traveler to modern Yugoslavia. A small child told the traveler that he was right-handed. My right hand is my worker, the child said, because I do everything with it. My left hand is the boss. Now I must learn to use my left hand to get rid of the boss. The double meaning of this marvelous insight is that the time and effort spent resisting the boss is implicitly or explicitly <clears throat> also some kind of reconstruction of the labor process. We hasten to add that this reconstruction is by no means necessarily revolutionary, although the so-called Mayo School of Industrial Relations tried to show how informal behavior of workers may actually frustrate in part the formal structure of a given plant. The informal or worker organized structure of the workplace may be more productive of surplus value than the formal structure set by the capitalist. Another example is the labor power of participation, which is more and more used by modern capitalist states in planning to make up for legitimation def deficits. Whether worker self-organization is for capital or for itself depends on real material possibilities, intent and consciousness, content of worker group norms, etc. Self-organized labor is unproductive of capital when it is self-conscious of itself as such or not manipulated, i.e. historically conscious, for example, as contrasted with the mass participation process in European fascism. The crucial point is that in capitalist production, two realities always coexist. One reality is the capitalist relations of production, the fatalistic acceptance of the individual's objective position as wage laborer, including the simple fear of losing a job. The other reality is the struggle against the simple fear of, or the other reality is the struggle against both the boss and the repressive mechanism of self-control class society develops with the aim of exacting obedience. This activity is unproductive, whether it is organized by one person against the passive part of himself or herself, or by a whole group of workers or the working class as a whole in the political sphere. It is unproductive activity, even though it is expended within the capitalist enterprise itself. Although historically, Marxists have been more reluctant to deal with this fact than anarchists, all labor within the production unit is simultaneously productive and unproductive. Modern sociology confirms that empirically with its findings of latent classes, class consciousness. Mann states that from surveys, we can easily perceive a latent consciousness of class, which in certain situations can explode. Hence, it is not difficult to, de to develop a theory of dual consciousness. 
Whatever the particular balance between productive and unproductive labor, a central problem for the analysis of capitalist economy is the determination of the conditions which create and are created by an antagonism between these two activities. An antagonism which is simply a form of the contradiction between the production relations and productive forces, and which historically does not come to the fore until capitalist production relations in general weaken and decay. The coexistence of productive and unproductive labor means that capital disaccumulation tendencies coexist with capital accumulation tendencies. Let us consider one dimension of the contradictory accumulation disaccumulation tendencies, again abstracting from the particular stage of capitalist development and decline. We know that productive labor creates surplus value and an increase in productive labor increases surplus value. We also know that productive labor has an ideological dimension, which we can sum up as the fatalist acceptance of wage labor by the worker. Hence, an increase in productive labor means an increase in the fatalistic acceptance of wage labor. If the increment to surplus value is converted into more means of production and labor power, more constant and variable capital, the wage labor capital relationship expands and capital accumulates in the objective sense of more means of production and more wage laborers and in the subjective sense of more fatalism on the part of workers. Unproductive labor lessens surplus value and a relative increase in unproductive labor further reduces surplus value. An increase in unproductive labor also means a decrease in the fatalistic acceptance of wage labor or an increase in conservative or progressive forms of self-organization. If the reduction in surplus value results in fewer new means of production and less additional labor power exploited by capital, and at the same time a qualitative or subjective change within the ranks of the employed workforce, the wage labor capital relationship contracts or weakens and capital disaccumulates in this double sense. We stress that we call the activity of weakening capital on productive labor rather than a decrease in productive labor, precisely because unproductive labor requires self-organization, i.e. alters the subjective moment of labor and hence reproduces a way of life that is different from the capitalist way of life. Whether and under what conditions this way of life looks backward in history or forwards into the future depends on the stage of capitalist, capitalist development and decline. For now, we only want to point out that self-conscious self-organization is a definite activity which deserves its own name. If unproductive labor is unproductive of capital in both the quantity, quantitative and qualitative senses, i.e. both objectively and subjectively, it is productive of one of two other social relationships or a combination thereof. These we call anarchist labor and socialist labor, which are predominantly backward-looking and forward-looking, respectively. Before we develop a formal schema of productive and unproductive labor and anarchist and socialist labor, we need to compare unproductive labor in production with unproductive labor in circulation. It will be recalled that the latter consists of activity which guards the commodity form of objects and services. We also recall that when workers sell their labor power, they must guard its commodity form, i.e. its exchange value. However, labor power does not literally change hands because it is an attribute of the free individual. We have already seen that the capitalist varies the kind and amount of labor power used in accordance with definite quantitative criteria. If we now turn the concept of variable capital on its head and view the labor process from the worker's standpoint, it is clear that workers themselves also can vary the kind and amount of labor power the boss actually uses. And because wage workers hand over their work power to someone else, they must be careful to guard or enhance its value not only before and during its sale, but also and especially after it is exchanged. This is the elementary form of class struggle in capitalist production, which seeks only to resist capital. Yet even this simple resistance requires an alternative form of organization among workers, e.g. informal agreements to restrict output. 
It must be stressed that the boss does not wish to use labor power for its use value, but rather is preoccup preoccupied with its exchange value, and hence in principle the boss has little or no stake in maintaining the capacity of the worker to produce particular use values. This is easily understood by comparing wage labor with the labor of the gardener who is hired to tend the boss's garden at home. In this case, the boss is not interested in exchange value production, but rather use value production. Hence, he will go to some length to avoid impairing the gardener's capacity to tend gardens. <clears throat> the capitalist owners of the means of production are not and cannot be personally responsible for the conditions under which labor power is consumed. They are subject to market forces of their own unintentional making and over which they have little or no control. This is the basic reason why workers need to guard their labor power in production as well as in circulation. Whether market forces are strong or weak, whether capitalist state political or social norms are absent or present in capitalist enterprises, whether guard activity has a conservative or progressive form and meaning, whether guard activity does or does not in the last analysis reproduce capitalism as a whole, etc., depends on whether capitalism as a system is developing or declining. Whatever the case, the guard is essential to prevent any deterioration of the value of work capacity, the only property the worker has. I have learned through sad experience, a woman worker said, that the more your superiors find they can get out of you, the more they come to expect. The only way to protect yourself is never to work at anything like full capacity. I know that most restriction of output is due to the worker's desire to save and protect yourself and not to any other motive. At the very minimum, this capacity saved is potentially revolutionary energy. Five, productive and unproductive labor schema. All kinds of variations and combinations of productive and unproductive activity in production are possible, and the social and political meaning of both activities is by no means immediately obvious in all or even most cases. But we can pin down at this stage the exact meaning of the relationship between unproductive labor and exploitation and alienation. In capitalism, surplus value is realized and hence appropriated by the capitalist class in exchange. Put another way, the precondition for the appropriation of surplus value is the prior appropriation of the total product of the workers. Surplus value is shared out among the capitalists in accordance with the amount of capital invested by the workings of the market. Total product is appropriated directly by individual capitalists from workers whose labor power they have purchased. Now it will be recalled that the explosion of the value category into variable capital and surplus value occurs when capitalism begins to replace independent commodity production. The surplus value concept is essential for, un for understanding the division of society's product into two general parts and the division of the two major classes, but this division or split refers only to the exploitation of the producers. This alone is insufficient because it ignores the fact that capitalism affects not only the distribution of values, but also the production of values. The fact that workers may resist value production makes the whole notion of value as a quantity of labor or a number of labor hours problematic. It cannot be assumed that the unproductive element in the workday is small or non-existent. Rather, it has to be proven. We believe that Marx proved that during the accumulation stage of capitalism, Thanks to the growing domination of capital, unproductive labor in production steadily decreases to the point where he could safely assume it away. In the declining stage of capitalism, however, it is not possible to make this assumption so confidently. The separation of value from surplus value, as theoretical categories, arises owing to the real separation of the producing class from the means of production. The separation of productive and unproductive labor arises owing to the separation of the producing class from the total product, which in the last analysis is also attributable to the separation of the workers from the means of production. Put another way, the fact of exploitation is dealt with in theory with the categories variable capital and surplus value. 
the fact of alienation which is necessary for and which precedes exploitation in capitalism, i.e. Value, values must be produced before they can be realized, is dealt with in theory with the categories productive and unproductive labor. This point needs to be emphasized and developed. It is clear that if the boss failed to appropriate the worker's product, he could not throw this product on the market for sale with the aim of realizing total values and surplus value. Hence, the appropriation or alienation of the worker's total product is a necessary but not sufficient condition for the exploitation of their labor. Necessary labor and surplus labor are not distinguishable empirically in terms of actual hours worked. The two parts of the workday are not perceptible to the worker who, if he resists the boss at all, does so during both parts of the workday. The reason is that the whole day is subject to the discipline of the capitalist, even though he eventually ends up with only the surplus product. This means that when workers rise against capital, the, ne the necessary product and not only the surplus product become threatened. Workers restrict output and engage in other forms of conservative or progressive unproductive labor because their product juridically belongs to the boss, thereby removing motives for working up to capacity, working in different ways, producing different things, or in certain situations, working at all. Workers are alienated from their product because they are alienated from the means of producing the product or the means and objects of production. This alienation is also necessary but not sufficient for the appropriation of surplus value. If workers use the means of production in the ways the boss wants them to, and assuming the boss knows what he is doing in uncertain market conditions, the workers engage in productive labor. Workers who break machines, waste raw materials, etc. because the means and objects of production do not belong to them, but rather are used to exploit their labor, expend labor unproductively. So do workers who seize the means of production with the purpose of producing use values directly to meet social needs. Because workers are alienated from the means of production as well as their own product, they are also alienated from other workers with whom they labor. Productive labor in this regard is the labor of workers who accept the relationships which the boss forces on them, who compete with one another on the job, who guard the boss's privileges from one another, etc. Unproductive labor is the activity of workers who cooperate with one another to end competition, etc., or to create new production relations within which new productive forces can be produced. Finally, individual workers are alienated from themselves. Productive labor in this regard is the labor of those workers who fatalistically accept the discipline of the factory and their own powerlessness in the workplace and who do what they are told to do, whether or not the boss's orders offends their inner reason or sense of integrity and morality. Unproductive labor is the labor of workers who resist this discipline through an internal struggle and who do not surrender their reason and inner convictions to the foreseeable authority of the boss. The connection between the theory of alienation, which Marx developed in his youth, and the theory of exploitation, which he advanced in his mature years, should not be clear, or should now be clear. Our hunch is that precisely because alienation from the means of production, the product of labor, etc., necessarily precedes exploitation, Marx hit upon the theory of alienation first and exploitation second. The alienation of workers from the means of production, their product, other workers, and themselves as individuals create the conditions for productive or unproductive labor. The forced sale of labor power owing to the workers' alienation from the means of production does not ensure that the boss can consume this labor power productively. Nor does the fact that the labor power is an attribute of the worker and not a thing ensure that labor power will be consumed unproductively. Depending on the movement of concrete labor processes and abstract labor, historically seen, the worker's alienation may create a consciousness level of physical and intellectual development, etc., which permits surplus value production to be maximized. In this event, workers produce as much as they can, both quantitatively and qualitatively, care for the means and objects of production as if they were their own, compete with fellow workers in the interest of the boss and resolve any internal conflicts in favor of capital. On the other hand, the worker's alienation may create a consciousness, etc., which does not permit the production of surplus value and, 
in the last analysis, does not permit any capitalist production. In this case, in production directly or through political change or both, the workers produce as little as they can or produce something other than what the boss demands, treat the means of production badly or use them for ends which cannot be reconciled with capitalist profit, cooperate with their fellow workers for subversive purposes, and question and reject the internalized boss within themselves as individuals. It is interesting to note that this is precisely what capitalist social theory calls alienation, as it is a form of withdrawal from wage labor and capitalist life generally. In fact, from the working class's standpoint, it is de-alienation, because withdrawal from the boss's authority normally requires the establishment of equal or more comradely relations with fellow and sister workers. In some, the alienation of the worker from the means of production is a precondition for capitalist exploitation, but not a sufficient condition. It has to be stressed that capitalist production is an extremely contradictory process which pits workers against the boss, workers against each other, and individual workers against themselves. Man against himself, Eric Fromm put it, forgetting women. <laughs> That's dumb. Now we can define a quantitative change in productive and unproductive labor. According to Marxist theory, labor is not productive if wages return to the workers' equivalent labor time to the amount of labor time expended by the workers. This means that necessary labor time or that part of the working day whose product has a value equal to the necessities of life required by the worker at the socially described level is unproductive. The only productive part of the workday from the standpoint of labor which produces surplus is the surplus labor producing surplus value. If, for example, workers organize a reduction in output, everything else being the same, surplus labor fails from, say, four to three hours, or falls from, say, four to three hours. Labor is still productive, even though unproductive labor has increased. Bearing this in mind, let us see how productive labor can expand absolutely and relatively. Then we will see how unproductive labor can expand absolutely and relatively, bearing in mind that unproductive labor in either its anarchist or socialist form is productive of some other production relation or productive force. Marx calls an absolute increase in productive labor an increase in absolute surplus value. One way to increase productive labor absolutely is to increase the amount of concrete labor by either increasing the pace of work or lengthening the hours of work. There are two ways to increase the pace of work by the speed up and stretch out. Both mean that the worker must engage in the same concrete labor tasks more often in a given day. The speed up is the name the workers give in order to work faster or in order to the foreman to move the assembly line faster. The stretch out means an order to a worker to keep more machines going at the same time. The speed up refers to machine operation tasks and assembly packaging, moving, loading, and similar jobs. The stretch out refers to machine tending operations in which the machine itself cannot be operated any faster. So the boss makes the worker tend more machines. There are many ways to increase uh, the hours of work. One way is simply to extend the workday, called by workers today compulsory overtime. Another way is to shave a few minutes off break time or lunch time. Still another is to refuse to pay the workers for cleaning up and dressing time, or the time it takes to descend an elevator shaft in a mine. There are many similar tricks that the bosses have used since the beginning of capitalism. A simple numerical illustration of an absolute increase in productive labor i.e. an increase in absolute surplus value is the following. Suppose that the workday is eight hours, four hours being surplus labor time. The rate of exploitation or rate of surplus value is four uh, to four, or unity. An increase in the workday of two hours, or is equivalent in the form of an increase in the pace of work, results in an increase in the rate of surplus value to one and one half, or six to four, 10 hours. <clears throat> 
The workers historically have labeled an increase in absolute surplus value, speed up, stretch out, etc. There are similar expressions in the language of every country in which capitalism has taken root, which is all of them. It is significant that these are workers' words, as they express the point of view of the worker when the boss attempts to increase exploitation, absolutely. Turning the analysis around, it is equally significant that the best-known words used to describe an increase in unproductive labor fuck, are boss's words. Workers can increase unproductive labor absolutely in two general ways. One way is to reduce the pace of work or slow down. The popular boss's word for this is feather bedding or soldiering on the job. Although in official officialese it is make work practi practice practices, the workers themselves sometimes say go easy, but this is appropriate this is a private la language normally confined within the factory walls. The other way to increase unproductive labor is to reduce hours of work. Since the struggle to reduce hours has been the main form of generalized class struggle for 150 years, the worker's name for this form of unproductive labor has one hands down. The eight-hour day was written on many a working class banner in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. 40 for 30 is another worker's slogan, meaning 40 hours pay for 30 hours work. A normal work day is also a working class expression, much favored by Marx, who understood that what is normal is relative and historical. We can use a numerical expression to illustrate an absolute decrease in productive labor. Again, suppose the work day is eight hours, four hours being surplus labor time, a decrease in the hours of work, or its equivalent in the pace of work of two hours results in a decrease in the rate of surplus value to one half or two to four, six hours. A good example of an increase in unproductive labor is the English working class practice of working to rule. This means that the workers adhere to formal administrative rules established over time within the enterprise, slowing down labor and hence reducing production. Working to, the, to rule became popular in England after World War II and today has reached the point that German capitalists referred to it as the English disease. <clears throat> there is a second and historically far more important way of expanding productive labor. Marx calls a relative increase in productive labor an increase in relative surplus value. Increases in absolute surplus value arise when workers are forced to work longer and harder at the same task. Relative surplus value increases when the worker is made to labor at different tasks with the aim of increasing the amount of production without necessarily changing the pace and hours of work. Any change in the concrete labor process that reduces socially necessary labor, i.e. the amount of labor needed to reproduce the laborer or total variable capital outlays, expands surplus value. One way to increase productive labor relatively is to change or modify the division of labor within a capitalist enterprise with the result that more values and surplus values are produced. This normally takes the form of specializing work functions and dividing up the labor process with the aim of expanding values without any change in total labor time. Sometimes this is accomplished by reduction, reductions in work setup and shutdown time. Sometimes the aim is to eliminate other unproductive gaps or crevices in the worker's workday. Often the boss wants to get rid of concrete labor processes which require high paid skilled labor. Every boss wants the best man on a particular job and seeks to hire and promote workers on the basis of merit, loyalty, etc. Whatever the particular method or aim, the function of expanding value production through specialization and division of labor is the reduction of socially necessary labor time. To illustrate numerically, suppose that the workday is eight hours, four hours being surplus labor time. A change in the division of labor which increases productivity and permits the workforce as a whole to maintain itself by only three hours of labor results in an increase in the rate of surplus value to one and two-thirds, five to three, um, eight hours. 
surplus value has increased relative, relatively because, by assumption, absolute labor time and pace remains the same. When capitalists reorganize the labor process and expand relative surplus value, there occurred two general effects on the workers. First, some workers whose labor is now redundant are laid off. In the event that total capital and the demand for labor power remain unchanged, workers who are laid off can no longer realize the value of their labor power. Historically, workers have resisted by working to rule, enforcing make-work rules, and in other ways. More workers may increase unproductive labor relatively by demanding that work functions be enlarged or set up, time increased, or safe or needed products produced or other changes be made that replace exchange value criteria in production with criteria based on need and use value. Second, the reorganization of the labor of workers who keep their jobs typically makes some existing worker capacities and skills redundant. In the course of accumulation acquired, in the course of accumulation, acquired skills are eliminated and concrete labor processes are simplified with the aim of reducing the skill labor element. In this and other ways, the effects of capitalist competition may be to cheapen the reproduction costs of labor power and hence drive down the average wage rate. On the other hand, capitalist competition may lead to increased skills and a higher reproduction cost of labor power. Lenin mentions this possibility and christens it the law of rising requirements. Today, there is the argument that automation requires greater skills and different skills of planning, coordination, control of production, etc. Worker resistance to capital's attack on traditional skills has taken the form of working to rule. Make work. Oh, fuck. Make work, mass strikes, etc. Under certain conditions, workers have the power to resist increases in relative surplus value and even to decrease surplus value relatively. Workers may also resist merit hiring and promotions by demanding that the oldest worker or the individual with the longest employment record rather than the best man be put on a particular job. Whatever the forms of attack and worker counterattack, changes in the division of labor which reduce the exchange value of labor power have two general effects and produce two general counter effects. Work rules which define with some precision what tasks each worker can do and cannot do have a double meaning. They prevent the layoff of some workers who the boss no longer wants and thus permits these workers to continue to realize the value of their labor power. They also prevent the dequalification of workers whom the boss wants to exploit more intensely by transforming them into easily replaceable unskilled workers. A relative expansion of unproductive labor can be illustrated this way. If the work day is eight hours and surplus labor time is four hours, struggles to expand work rules laid down by the workers themselves, etc., reduce relative surplus value to, say, three hours. The second general way of increasing relative surplus value is to provide the workers with more or better tools to work with. Machinery may permit the same total value to be produced with less living labor time, i.e. shorter hours or fewer workers. Typically, if total capital remains the same, an increase in relative surplus value owing to mechanization means that some workers will be redundant and the concrete labor tasks of other workers transformed. The other side is the worker's resistance to mechanization, which may take open and crude forms such as machine breaking or industrial sabotage, or again it may take the form of output restriction. Similarly, unproductive labor may appear in the form of state regulations, such as building codes which prohibit the use of machinery, e.g. codes forbidding spray painting of houses. <coughs> or it may take more subtle forms, such as attempts to force the boss to employ lead off workers elsewhere in the plant. Changes in the division of labor, development of new concrete labor tasks and skills, mechanization, etc. may expand relative surplus value. On the other hand, these changes may lower relative surplus value by increasing the reproductive costs or reproduction costs of the workforce. This possibility has been mentioned by Andre Gortz, 
but there is no systematic analysis of it. It is possible and likely that over time, industrialization, separation of places of work, residence and recreation, proliferation of dwelling units, urbanization, privatization of life, development of mass media, and the incorporation of capitalist culture into the commodity form generally alter the material environment and shape the consciousness of workers in ways which actually increase the exchange value of labor power by expanding and diversifying worker needs. In this event, new means of production and methods of work are no longer means and methods for increasing productive labor relatively. Over time, the accumulation process may negate itself, i.e. transform into disaccumulation. Workers' wage struggles and social and political battles for a different and better material and social life in the context of an increasingly complex social environment and runaway individualism in consumption reproduction may actually result in pushing variable capital outlays up and driving surplus value down. Before we continue, we must, we must stress that in historical fact, in the accumulation stage of capitalist development, abstract labor, productive labor, and surplus value expanded absolutely and relatively at the same time. On the other hand, resistance to the expansion of productive labor in both ways combined various forms and aims of worker struggle. Only analytically is it possible to make the separation between the movement to reduce hours of work, protect the place of the skilled worker in the production process, prevent overwork by work rules and slowdowns, raise wages in accordance with growing needs, etc., etc. We have finally to discuss increases in productive labor, which occur when workers quit their jobs less frequently and alternatively increases in unproductive labor, labor when workers are able to be absent or quit work more often and with more frequency. Absenteeism requires individualist self-organization in the form of breaking an implicit, in, implicit, Im, fuck, implicit agreement with the boss to remain on the job for a particular time and using labor power for something else or resting it. Quitting also requires individual self-organization because normally workers work less hard or well once they have decided to quit, their mind is on their new job. There are also other sources of unproductive labor involved with increased absenteeism and quit rates which do not require self-organization at any level, but which should be mentioned. Changes in productive and unproductive labor typically occur in the short run over the course of the capitalist business cycle. The long run trends toward greater productive and unproductive labor arising from labor turnover may also be identified both theoretically and empirically. In any capitalist enterprise during the period of production, the boss must be able to count on having so many workers working together in a certain division of labor for a certain time. In economic boom periods, the demand for labor power normally grows faster than the supply and job vacancies increase, faster than the number of workers seeking jobs. A general upgrading of workers occurs as quit rates increase in relatively low paid firms and jobs with substandard working conditions. Absenteeism also increases. When workers quit or absent themselves from work during the production period, the normal result is a reduction in production and profits. Absenteeism warns the manpower administration of the US Department of Labor is costly to employers in loss of production, forced substitution of untrained workers, increased insurance rates, replacement training of standby employees, and record keeping. Some employers in estimating abs absenteeism costs equate every 1% of absenteeism to 1% of lost profits. No one knows more about the unproductive labor that results when workers refuse to come to their jobs and hence reduce production by impairing the division of labor within the enterprise than the state agency assigned to deal with the problem. A lengthy quotation will not be out of place. Casual and unsystematic handling of the problem has made ineffective many programs aimed toward reducing absenteeism. Personnel, ma personnel managers may de-emphasize labor wastage costs in their periodic reports to top management, 
fearing that they may be held responsible if absenteeism is too high. Likewise, supervisory staff, foremen, and operational managers may be reluctant to report costs resulting from absenteeism because they might be held accountable for workers over whom management has given them little control. These hidden factors lead to pyramiding of costs to all departments concerned. The costs of absenteeism can be identified in overstaffing to off offset absenteeism, lost production, fluctuating quality, idle machinery and unused investment, disrupted schedules, overtime, shifting of staff, material spoilage, higher inventory caused by delays in production and shipments, plus time spent by supervisors, foremen, and clerical staff to maintain records and deal with factors causing absenteeism and to provide solutions to the problem. Workers who quit their jobs with the aim of getting higher wages or better working conditions reduce the rate of exploitation in the economy as a whole. Like absenteeism, increased quit rates mean lost time, which reduces the boss's profits in a number of ways. There is the lost time in production before the worker leaves the company, since the average worker seldom works to full capacity right up to the moment he or she leaves. The loss of key men on the production line will cut the production of every man on the line. <coughs> there is more lost production during training when the trainee's work is below standard, and also the lost time of associate workers who helped train new workers. More turnover causing influx of trainees can lower the standard of quality workmanship since other operators must offset the inferior workmanship of the trainee by more time and effort on their part to make the product meet specifications. Further, excessive turnover causes the supervisors to spend more time in training new employees and leaves them less time to oversee and plan for their departments, which often results in erratic production flow. What happens is that the loss of production narrows the spread of indirect labor costs, resulting in a greater charge to the fewer items produced, affecting the margin of profit on every item produced. Finally, the accident rate may increase as turnover increases. The National Safety Council observed that 30% of industrial accidents were caused by the worker's lack of knowledge or skill, or his unfamiliarity with the workplace. In conclusion, we stress that it is the social meaning of human activity within capitalist production which stamps labor productive or unproductive. Sit-downs, wildcat strikes, and official strikes which interrupt or destabilize the labor process may increase unproductive labor. On the other hand, if the boss has excess supplies on hand and has prepared for the moment that the workers walk out, a strike may be nothing more than a capitalist lockout. Worker self-organization is a necessary but not sufficient condition for unproductive labor. The sufficient condition is that the workers must organize themselves on the boss's time with the effect of undermining the capitalist productive forces or production relations. The most general meaning of unproductive labor in production is that factories, offices, tools, etc. become less means of control of labor and laborers, and hence less means of surplus value production. <clears throat> but the capitalistic nature of the means of production and labor is undermined by socialist labor alone. By contrast, the general form of productive labor is activity that results in the domination of capital, i.e. in capitalistic or, qual or qualitative or fuck, in capitalistic or quantitative criteria guiding decision making within production. Six, anarchist labor and socialist labor. There are dozens of specific forms of unproductive labor in production and thousands of ways that workers may expand unproductive labor. But there are only two general forms corresponding to the twofold nature of the work process, i.e. that labor is simultaneously a force and relation of production. These two forms we call anarchist labor and socialist labor. Both are forms of self-organized activity of workers within the capitalist enterprise, 
and also politically, which we ignore here. Both forms of unproductive labor have the immediate but not necessarily long-run effect of undermining or subverting the capitalist production relations. Both attempt to replace these relations with others which are not based on the technology of labor time. Unlike other forms of unproductive labor, e.g. exchange, which drain surplus value even though they are necessary for the reproduction of the system as a whole, anarchist and socialist labor temporarily or permanently exacerbate the contradictions of capitalism and threaten the reproduction process. Anarchist and socialist labor thus tend to be productive of non-capitalist modes of production, although how strong and permanent the tendency actually is must be a historical question, since both are historical categories which arise in different stages of capitalism. Also, they have different social and political meanings in different stages of development and decline. For example, anarchist labor necessarily has a conservative meaning during the stage of capital accumulation and capitalist development. Anarchist labor develops first among newly proletarianized artisans, peasants, etc. Early in the accumulation stage. In essence, anarchist labor seeks to stop the development of capitalism. It consists of the resistance of the old mode of production so the new capitalist mode, or to the new capitalist mode. By contrast, socialist labor seeks to build another mode of production within the existing mode and is thus a form of resistance, which transcends capitalist relations. Typically, anarchist labor is individualistic and its most extreme form is spontaneous industrial sabotage. Seen abstractly, anarchist labor is the activity of small producers who have lost the freedom which was once theirs in production and who seek to regain it by striking out against capitalists or machinery or rules or laws which threaten to make redundant the production knowledge of skilled workers, hitting back at rate busters, taking back land seized earlier by capital, etc. Also, it is the labor of workers who seek to extend to production the individualism and independence which they experience in circulation. The individualism which characterizes petty commodity production and exchange normally precedes the forced collectivization of labor in capitalist production. And the individualism which is characteristic of capitalist circulation also precedes the tyranny of capitalist production i.e. labor power and means of production must be bought in the market before production can begin. In the same way, anarchist labor in principle precedes socialist labor and in fact may be interpreted as a transition to socialist labor. Historically, anarchist labor is a conservative reaction to capitalist alienation and exploitation and hence it is normally unstable and rarely, if ever, assumes organizational forms beyond anarcho-syndicalism. Objectively, the immediate and typically short-lived result of anarchist labor is the undermining not only of the capitalist production relations, but also the productive forces, i.e. the product of wage labor, which threatens the existence of independent <coughs> commodity production, or the product of unskilled labor which threatens the existence of skilled labor. And whose objective interests is it to destroy both capitalist productive forces and production relations? The independent producers and craft workers who seek to protect and conserve their way of life against capitalist production relations and superior capitalist productive forces and the capitalist monopoly of production knowledge. Like anarchist labor, socialist labor is a reaction against capitalist tyranny. Unlike anarchist labor, socialist labor does not seek to protect or conserve either independent production or the production knowledge of the individual craft worker. Socialist labor negates wage labor and requires new social relationships which transcend mere guard labor or labor which seeks to protect or roll back the status quo. If anarchist labor seeks to change the relations of production in favor of the craft worker or small producer, 
socialist labor seeks to change the production relations of all workers independent of the commodity, capitalist form of these relations. Socialist labor is hence a practical critique, not only of capitalist production, but also of anarchist labor. Socialist labor subverts or overthrows capitalist production relations without, at the same time, destroying the productive forces. Rather, socialist labor seeks to reconstruct the labor process by establishing freely cooperative productive or production relations within the working class as a whole, within which the productive forces developed under capitalism can be used for different ends. The second step is the development of socialist productive forces themselves. Within the capitalist unit and between capital units, i.e. economic and political levels respectively, socialist labor breaks down the relationships be between boss and worker, and worker and worker, established by the boss with the purpose of taking over the means of production and giving them new meaning rather than destroying them. Socialist labor seeks to use the means and objects of production to produce use values directly for need, not exchange values, i.e. socialist labor seeks to control, mold, and shape things, not people. Unlike anarchist labor, it requires a consciousness of what you are doing as such. The fiat workers who for a time seized control of the means of production and eliminated the production of high-priced cars for which there was an active market and expanded the output of low-cost models for which no market existed <clears throat> engaged in socialist labor. In sum, socialist labor embodies collective and creative rational attributes of the producers and reflects social or collective needs. If wage labor is the need to produce exchange values for individual consumption, socialist labor is the choice of producing use values for social consumption. Unproductive labor and production in either its anarchist or socialist or combined form is the theoretical category which corresponds to the living critique of capitalist production by workers qua workers, i.e. the class struggle in production. The struggle of the producers in the workplace and political sphere over the character of the production relations and the meaning and exact uses of the productive forces is the heart of the proletarian revolution. Whether this struggle occurs within a particular workplace or in the political sphere between the working class and capitalist class, workers must contend with the capitalists as owners of the means, objects, and results of production and the controllers of the labor process. No pretense is possible that this conflict is merely another battle between two classes of property owners. The reason is that in production itself, the working class is formally propertyless. Workers' struggle in circulation contrasts sharply with the struggle in production. In circulation, workers attempt to get a higher price and better terms, generally for the labor power they sell or rent in the market. They contend with capitalists as labor power owners, not as producers. Wage struggles thus do not and cannot abolish or undermine alienation and exploitation directly, but only affect the terms of alienation and exploitation, and hence alienation and exploitation as such only indirectly, if at all. To complete this survey of productive and unproductive labor, a few words about service labor are required. As we have seen, unproductive labor in material production is self-organized activity which undermines the production relations or productive forces or both and is manifest in less surplus value product produced and realized. Unproductive Unpro labor in direct customer services manifests itself in a different form. Since there are no objects which mediate between producer and user, when the service worker resists capital, the customer may be the immediate victim. The customer is also the victim of the boss's speed up of service labor. A food and restaurant writer hit the nail on the head from the consumer's standpoint when he wrote about the service in a French restaurant that all the frantic activity takes its toll on the humor of the bartenders, waiters, waitresses, and busboys who seem to me to be too busy to do their jobs properly. This sharply contrasts with material production where the speed up means that commodities are delivered more cheaply to the consumer under competitive market conditions 
and in the last analysis also explains why direct services are more compatible with the petty commodity mode of production. <clears throat> Perhaps the most common example of unproductive labor in direct services, whether or not the result of speed up, is the rude clerk who believes or acts as if he believes that it is the customer's needs that are oppressive, not the boss's orders. The class struggle in, the, in this case pits workers against customers who typically are also workers. On the other hand, service labor like material labor has a double meaning i.e. it is a productive force and production relation. As a production relation, the service is rendered in a certain role for its exchange value, not for its use value. If the exchange value of the service did not exceed the exchange value of the worker's capacity to render the service, i.e. if the worker refuses the role, no, pr no production would occur. This means that there is another form of rebellion open to the service worker, namely to render the service strictly for its use value, i.e. out of the role of make-believe. An example is the auto mechanic who takes his time and does a careful job despite the fact that the boss expects quick and hence sloppy work. This example gives us a glimpse of anarchist and socialist labor and service production. Anarchist labor subverts the production relations and also destroys the productive forces without replacing them with more advanced forces. In the services, this means that the rude clerk disobeys the boss keep a smile on your face, drives away the customer and subverts his own abilities to give service. Socialist labor undermines the production relations without destroying the productive forces, but rather redefines and expands them. The mechanic who takes his time to do a good job at the expense of the boss's profits exemplifies socialist labor. In direct services, there is an additional complication to the concepts of productive and unproductive labor. The boss seeks to expand productive labor by ordering the mechanic to go fast, or the boss may change the division of labor in the garage so that the customer has no opportunity to discuss his car engine with the person who actually is supposed to fix it. But the customer wants the mechanic to go slow or reject the new division of labor in order that technical questions may be answered by the mechanic himself. The mechanic is thus caught in the middle. The speed up has one meaning for the boss, another for the customer, and still another for the mechanic. The worker, in this case, has four general options. He can speed up work and give the customer short shrift, which combines productive labor with unproductive anarchist labor. He can speed up his repair work and take more time with the customer. This results in a trade-off and leaves the amount of productive labor more or less unchanged, even though even though the mechanic must work harder. He can slow down the repair work and ignore the customer's concerns and rebuff his questions. This reply is purely anarchic, a small act of rebellion against the world. Or the mechanic can slow down the work and also spend more time with the customer than the boss believes to be profitable. This is socialist labor, as well as it can be developed within this particular framework of capitalist production relations. In any case, the illusion that the consumer is sovereign is destroyed. Unless the service worker rebels, consumers get what the boss wants them to get. If we define the productive forces as the worker's knowledge of production and distribution and energy and imagination, as well as the means and objects of production, then we can say that socialist labor is the abolition of the capitalist production relations by the productive forces. It is the transformation by the producing class itself of itself from historical object to subject. In this general light, the difference between productive labor and socialist labor is the, is the difference between a working class which necessarily permits itself to be used like a machine and a class which is able to take its destiny into its own hands. As we know, Marx's theory of productive labor is required to understand the production and accumulation of capital. He used impersonal language because he needed to show that wage workers do not count as real people in the process of capital accumulation, i.e. that objective social laws operate independent of any individual's intention or will. The theory of unproductive labor is needed to understand the destruction of capital, 
when the producing class ceases to be merely the raw material of history and begins to consciously shape its own history, then the impersonal language of Marx must be abandoned. When Marx wrote that capital does this or that, he meant that the social relations within the capitalist class, i.e. competition, and between capitalists and workers, i.e. struggle, work out in certain knowable ways, whether or not anyone is aware of them. But when the working class consciously begins to direct its own activity for its own purposes, we can no longer say capital does this or that. Rather, we must make room in the theory of capitalism for the self-conscious and self-organized activity of the working class and say that workers do this or that. <clears throat> Different ways must be found to express this whole line of reasoning. If we try to grasp the meaning of the productive forces by themselves, the first thing we must understand is that they do not exist as an independent entity. They always exist in the form of a certain production relationship. Hence, if we seek the theoretical meaning of the productive forces, independent of the relations within which they develop, these relations must be abstracted from. The main point here is that the living purpose of socialist labor and socialist revolution is to separate in fact what at present and in the main can be separated only in theory. To abstract the productive forces from the oppressive production relations is in reality the self-liberating mission of the working class. No one can deny that the production relations are, far, are part of the productive forces in the sense that they consist of cooperation, division of labor among the workers, specialization of functions, etc., as well as the hierarchy of capitalist control in the enterprise. But it has to be stressed that the division of labor and specialization of work function is merely the form in which the capitalist production relations appear, i.e. capitalist production relations include the relations between workers established by the capitalists. But these relations between workers, i.e. the organization of work, are also a productive force. Hence, the relations between workers have a double and contradictory character. The living form of the contradiction between the productive forces and, and production relations is the contradiction between the organization of workers established by capital and the self-organization of workers established in their own interests. Turning the point around, the self-organization of labor in the socialist form, socialist labor, is clearly a productive force as well as a produc production relation. <coughs> socialist labor abolishes capitalist production relations and at the same time creates social production relations which liberate the productive forces by liberating the working class. Socialist labor abolishes the living contradiction between the forces and relations of production in capitalist economy by substituting self-organization for capitalist tyranny. At the same time, it frees the productive forces that capitalist production relations suppress or distort, namely the independent and creative activity of the workers themselves. Although capital means that workers are treated like machines, the growth of the productive forces, which includes the growth of self-organization of the workers, makes it possible for the constant and unrelenting struggle of reorganizing the production relations in the direction of socialist labor. Marx's message is that workers not in struggle are not fully human. Their passivity means that they are permitting themselves to be used as machines. Struggle is thus essential for the self-liberation of the working class in the double sense of freeing the productive forces and the production relations. The big theoretical question thus turns on the objective historical conditions under which class struggle negates itself versus those conditions.